Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Camille Maddett. I'm the associate pastor uh, here at the church. And what a joy it is to be together this morning. What a joy it is to celebrate World Communion. That's such a special opportunity for worship, for a reminder that following Jesus includes, yes, a personal relationship, but it's also so much, so much more than that. It's about being part of the family of God. This morning, we join together with Christians all across the world, giving thanks to God, celebrating new life through Jesus. Our communion table is a reminder of that diversity and community. Thankful to Jen for preparing such a beautiful table with a variety of bread symbolizing both our differences and our connections. You know, part of the power of World Communion Sunday is the way in which it amplifies both our God-given unity as well as our God-given diversity. Today around the world, the family of God is worshiping in big cathedrals and in simple one-room buildings, in structures made from mud bricks and in modern multi-purpose facilities. The people of God are singing and praying in services that are traditional or modern, formal and informal. Today, no matter where they worship, God is gathering us together at God's table. Today's an opportunity for us to live out our faith in a way that instead of separating and dividing us, becomes a channel for reconciliation and for peace. And so as we celebrate World Communion this morning, I think we should start with just a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we know you're with us in this place, in places of worship across the globe and present beyond those places as well. Move your spirit among us. Stir within us a longing to be unified as your family. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. I want to begin this morning with our scripture. It's Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. The church was dealing with some disagreements. We don't really know what that was about, but it was something significant enough that Paul wrote the letter from prison, encouraging them to get along. He begins in the first chapter by thanking them for their partnership in the gospel, by encouraging them to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of Christ. And then we have our passage from the second chapter of Philippians. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, Paul's writing to a church in the middle of disagreements with each other. He calls on them to be of the same mind, to have the same love. Now, this is not saying that Paul was telling them that they all have to think the same way. We are never going to agree on everything. That's simply impossible. Having the same mind doesn't mean that we're pressured to all think alike or to think one way about everything. The Greek word for thinking is much broader than just thoughts. It's about expressing concern for one another, creating a sense of relational harmony, working through differences and tensions to create deeper, compassionate connections. So maybe what Paul is encouraging the church to do is not to conform to one particular way of thinking, but rather to think fondly of each other, to hold each other in their hearts. It's the, that when we're of the same mind, that means that we can encourage each other, we can comfort, we can share with each other. That we are of the same mind when we hold each other tenderly and with mercy and love and joy. 
You know, Paul, go, Paul goes on to tell the church that to be of the same mindset of Jesus, to love like Jesus loved with radical inclusiveness. Being in the same mindset of Jesus means that we have to draw the circle wide, wider than the world would want us to draw it, wider than we think may be possible, wider than we may be comfortable with ourselves. Will Willimon is a retired Methodist bishop, and he describes this radical inclusiveness, this drawing the circle wide by saying this. There's a lot we don't know about Christ, but one thing we know for sure is that he brought people together. He begins his ministry by assembling 12 disciples, people who had nothing in common with one another except that Christ had called them to walk with him. Jesus got in trouble for uniting despairing sinners and presumptuous saints. He saves us by assembling us, by putting us in a group, by teaching us to call those whom the world would regard as strangers or enemies as sister, as brother. You know, I think this is what John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, understood was part of being the family of faith and having the same mindset of Jesus. He preached a sermon on unity. Wesley had to address what was a climate of religious controversy and intolerance that was so prevalent in his day. And so the scripture passage that he chose to preach on Christian unity actually wasn't a gospel passage about love and agreement. Instead, it came from the Old Testament. It told the story of a violent ousting of uh, King Jehor by King Jehu. And as Jehu is traveling, and in the process of becoming king of Israel himself, he greets a leader from one of the tribes of Israel named Jehonadab and asks him, is your heart one with mine? And when he answers yes, Jehu includes him on as an advisor of sorts. And I want you to note that he doesn't ask if he supports him. He doesn't ask if they agree on all the same things. He doesn't ask if they have the same worship styles or the same faith practices. He simply asks, are you of the same heart? Wesley uses this passage to teach that our differences of opinions do not matter more than our need to be of the same heart. He says this, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike. May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Being of one heart, loving alike, is the foundation of who we are called to be when we follow Jesus. That's why we come to the communion table. We come to God's table to remember, to remember Jesus, to remember his life and his death, to remember that we are living into, that we are helping to create the very kingdom of God that he taught, the very kingdom of God that is here and now. Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. Each time he described the kingdom of God, he was trying to get his disciples to see the world in a new way. A way of seeing the word governed not with power and authority, but ruled by God's grace and God's love. So maybe there's a better word. The better word might be the kingdom of God. Using the word kingdom implies a community where all individuals are considered family. We have kinship not just with each other, but with God. The kingdom of God has to do with a coming together of peoples, with no one being excluded and no one being included at the expense of another. The kingdom of God is created when instead of working to become part of the structures of exclusion, we work to do away with those such structures. Kingdom for us means living into the love of God. It means being in the same mindset of Jesus. It means that when we say God's love and grace and forgiveness is available for all, all means all without exceptions. Now this goes against what the world around us wants. But this is who we are called to be as the church, to acknowledge our unity and diversity, to celebrate that God's people are distinct and diverse and different, and to know that in our diversity we are also united in love and service. What a gift this is to our broken and fearful world, 
A world in which differences divide us, cause us to fear and even hate one another. But to live into the kingdom of God here and now is what we are called to do, to work, to help build that kingdom of God here and now. I think Paul knew this when he was writing to the church in Philippi, and he makes a a similar description in Romans by saying this, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Let love be genuine. That's what we're called to do. That's what it means to live into the kingdom of God. That's what we celebrate today on World Communion Sunday. Our global worship is a witness to the world that as God's many Christian people, we commit to know and to respect one another despite our differences. That we will seek to build bridges of understanding and interact even when the divide feels too wide that we will work together to create partnerships of service and mission. That's what we're doing as we uh, pack 20,000 meals to feed the hungry with Rise Against Hunger. Now, this may seem a lot to ask when the world around us is constantly seeking to divide us because of politics, because of religion, because of our differences, but we are called to be genuine in our love and to hold fast to what is good. Several years ago, I was introduced to a documentary and its companion book, No Joke. It tells the story of three clergymen in Peoria, Illinois, whose friendship is challenging and transforming their community. It's titled No Joke because those three clergymen consist of an evangelical pastor of a megachurch, a Muslim imam, and a Jewish rabbi. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. A rabbi, a pastor, and an imam walk into a room. But it's the furthest thing from a joke. These three religious leaders are dear, dear friends who are letting their love be genuine in in order to overcome the problems of what they call otherizing. Otherizing is our tendency to compartmentalize individuals into not always helpful categories. We see each other as groups and not individuals. These three men understand that when you see the image of the divine in another, it's not possible to otherize them. Now, Jim Henderson is the author of the book, the uh, producer of the documentary, and he tells their story to share what he considers the three practices for crossing the difference divide. Three practices that allow our love for others to be genuine. Three practices that uh, allow us not to think alike, but to love alike. The first practice is to be unusually interested in others. When we take the time to get to know each other, when we hear each other's stories, when we know another's name and history, we can begin to stop otherizing each other. Differences get in the way of seeing the humanity of those around us. These three clergymen are proof that stepping outside our circle can only lead to the genuine love of those who are around us. And so we cannot begin to love each other until we begin to see each other. And so we have to become interested in others. The second practice is to stay in the room with differences. Now this one is probably the hardest. There's so much that divides us, and it is so much either to, to push away what is different. But genuine love requires us to open our circle wider. Jesus surrounded himself with those that he was supposed to avoid. He called those who were different than him beloved. These three clergymen understood that staying in the room is not about fighting, it's not about debating, it's not about trying to convert others to your side. It's about maintaining relationships. Now, Jim Henderson is quick to add that this does not mean staying in the room with abusers. This does not mean enabling or being codependent. 
This is about knowing that the individual opposite you, even if they have drastically different beliefs, is still a beloved creation of God. And finally, the third practice is to stop comparing their worst to your best. Now, this one is a bit of a punch in the gut for me. Maybe it is for you, too. It's so easy to think that we are better than the others in our lives, to think that we never respond in the same kind of hate or frustrations or anger, but we all have moments where we fail to be genuine in love. We have all left a trail of pain and sorrow behind us, But if we expect others to live to the standards that we do not even hold ourselves to, we cannot be genuine in our love. Now, these three practices are not easy, especially in an election year. But I believe these three practices are vital to helping us to answer the call to be genuine in our love. When we can see the divine in the faces of those around us, it is transformational. Genuine love can transform us. It can transform the world around us. It can. It already has, and it will continue to do so, which is why we need the three practices, which is why we need a campaign for kindness. You heard Aubrey mention at the beginning of the service that next week we begin our new sermon series, Do Unto Others. And it's not just a sermon series. It's a campaign to help close the kindness and justice gap in our country. It's an invitation to consider how we want to be treated and how to treat others, including those with whom we disagree. We're uniting with churches across the country to live into the mindset of Jesus, one centered in genuine love and kindness. Today, after worship, you can pick up those do unto other yard signs, It's an opportunity to help us spread the message of kindness across the San La Corita Valley. It's a chance to share the message that love, compassion, humility, respect, kindness are possible, and that we can love each other despite our differences. Next week, we will even have t-shirts for sale. They're available in both uh, gray and purple. We have sizes for kids and for adults. It's another opportunity to share this message, to live into this genuine love as a reality. A campaign for kindness, a reminder that we are loved by God and that we are called to love others, to remember that Jesus taught us to keep drawing the circle wider and wider and not to build up walls. As we prepare to move into our world communion liturgy, I want to share this picture It's from a United Methodist pastor and artist. Her name is uh, Jan Richardson. It's titled, The Best Supper. It's a beautiful piece that she created for World Communion Sunday. She also wrote a blessing to accompany this photo. It's called A Blessing for World Communion. And I want to share it with you because I think it says beautifully what Jesus has done, what Jesus has taught us, and how we are called to be a part of the kingdom of God. A blessing for World Communion Sunday. And the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will be open wide to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust that there is enough And we will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame. And we will turn towards each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world. And we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become the blessing. And everywhere will be the feast. What a beautiful gift for us on this World Communion Sunday. 
Many breads, but one body. Many minds, but one heart. Many languages, but one voice. Thanks be to God for this amazing gift, for this reminder for our hearts and for our world. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? God of us all, you are present with us in this moment, inviting us to join your son Jesus at the table. As we eat the bread and drink of the juice, help us to remember all that he has taught us and all that he has called us to be. Help us to have a mindset of Jesus so that we might build your kingdom here and now. May we continue to seek to be of one heart with all we encounter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.